everyone. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live. We're here with you every Tuesday for our session on Q&As with our experts and friends in the hernia world. My name is Shirin Tofai. I'm your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Thank you to everyone who's joining us on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai and on Zoom. And many of you also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. At the end of this show, we will post, I will post um, the link so you can watch and share on my YouTube channel. I'm super excited because we have a true hernia surgery expert uh, today. Not that anyone else was fake before, but we have Dr. Todd Henneford. Many of you already know him, know his name. You've read his articles. Dr. Henneford is a big deal. He's at Atrium Health at Charlotte, North Carolina. You can follow him on Facebook at Todd.Henneford and on Twitter at T. Henneford. So please welcome my friend, Dr. Henneford or Todd. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, Sharon. Thank you so much for coming. I just finished surgery and like ran to do this, but um, you always look dapper. So that's good. Mm, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, many of you know you and I already told you that uh, as part of the kind of promotion of Hernia Talk, we seek questions from our, our people out there that, that sure. watch and support Hernia Talk. And then everyone's really excited. So we have lots of questions for you, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of intro, which is I first met you through the American Hernia Society right. uh, meeting. You've been past president of the American Hernia Society meeting. And what's unique about you besides, you know, we all do hernia surgeries. We all put in mesh, take out mesh, do tissue repairs, reconstructions, et cetera, because that's our specialty. But what's unique with you is number one, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were the, you may be the first or at least the largest kind of attempt, uh, initiation of a true hernia center where you have a dedicated space with surgeons and accessories to surgeons, whether they're physical therapists, whoever, and lots of huge research team only dedicated to hernias. And you may recall in 2008, when I started at Cedar Center, I'd give you a call because I wanted to build a hernia center at my hospital, which didn't work out. Um, no one was interested <laughs> except me. But uh, as part of that, you did host me at your center and I got to like see the whole area and, and how the flow is and your research and your clinical trials and the office flow. And it was really, really great. But maybe initially you can just tell me a bit about how it all happened. How did you go from finishing general surgery residency to, I want to be a hernia surgeon to let's actually make this a legitimate specialty where we have a whole center focus on one disease. Well, I, so no one, no one starts wanting to be a hernia surgeon. That's, Me either. I'm yeah, of course, of course. And, <laughs> so true. <laughs> and so when, uh, I, after I finished my residency, I went to the Cleveland clinic. And uh, so I did really the, 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 the chest and the abdomen, its contents. You know, I did lots of different surgery. And so when I, then when I, I came to Charlotte, you know, I was a, um, the first person really to start elective surgery. And so I did oh. uh, advanced laparoscopy. I did gastric bypass. I did, we had the largest series in the world of like distal pancreatectomies, gastrectomies, splenectomies, doll done laparoscopic, field chromocytomas, huge series of this. But then you hire other specialists. And so where my where my real drive was, I do a soft gel surgery, so I do hiatal hernias, and I do a lot of a lot of abdominal reconstruction, much like much like you. And so that's where I spend a lot of my practice. So I, <clears throat> you hire a patibulary, you hire bariatric, you hire you know, my it. partner Ken Kircher does all the solid organ, <clears throat> but and uh, but we developed a real interest in doing abdominal reconstruction because it, you know honestly the, there was no specialist. Mm -hmm. the, the hernia repairs were actually done to get to the next operation. And so there was so much lacking as far as the science and hernia repair and, you know, real specialists in hernia yeah. repair. And you saw it, you, you saw it in your place when I saw it in my place, mm -hmm. you know, we built our hernia center in 2004. You were trying to trying to get people's interest in 2004. You yeah. rang the bell. I was just very lucky to get our CEO of our hospital system and, and uh, you know, saw that saw the real need. And then we were able to, so we now have like three full-time data collectors who collect all of our data and has been doing that. We have over 10,000 hernia repairs at our institution that we've been able to track the data in. And this made us, it, it's demonstrated for us you know, how we can be better surgeons. 
And so uh, with that, it's interesting. I've had many fellows who've actually come in, who've trained with us, and they come to do our mental invasive surgery. They come to do the esophageal surgery. They come to do those sorts of things. And, and many of you are very good friends, like you know, Mike Rose and Yuri Nowitzki and yeah. Igor Belyinsky and uh, Christy Harold. These people, they then go to academic institutions and they become abdominal reconstruction and hernia surgeons. And the reason being is, it's because no one who's there who can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so they, they become pigeonholed into this area and they love it and they become you know, internationally renowned abdominal reconstruction surgeons because much like you, you fill this huge niche in California that, that you know, whether it's you know, repairing your hernia or redoing your hernia or taking out the mesh or taking care of complications or taking care of quality of life you know, and those sorts of things. And then you become very busy. So our, our young people who come in with us try to and, and do minimum days of surgery, it's so interesting how they actually go out and become and do what you and I do. Yeah, and I think uh, the other point I want to bring up, which is a nice segue, is uh, because of how what you started and probably your own personal kind of uh, the way that you you do work is you've mentored so many leaders in hernia surgery, so many future presidents of the American Hernia Society, people that have really pioneered different aspects of hernia surgery, and they've all kind of somehow like gone through you, <laughs> many wow. of them. And that's were, been really something very beautiful to see. Well, they would have been successful no matter. They're super smart people. Yeah. I mean, hard driving, personal excellence. They would have been successful if they were selling cars or whatever they did. They would have done extremely well. And they just so happened to land with me. And then they've gone on to do great things. And then they, and, and, and the wonderful thing is, is like now the people that they're training. Yes. Yeah, I'm getting older. So I'm like, you know, you have grand fellows, <laughs> yes, uh, which is correct. like not only fellows, the people that you, that, that you train, but then the people they train, which is wonderful. It's just yeah, great. it's really yeah. beautiful to see. And then and it's yeah. become a nice family. So it really has. Yeah. yeah. It's, and been great. it's all and it's interesting to see that uh, you and I met when you were on the, uh, on the we were on the board of the. You yeah. Know, the 2003, attorneys. maybe when we were young. Yeah, and then, well, and then I was they, younger, but yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then they recruit you to come back. Yes. So you would Correct. come back onto the board again because yeah. of your because of what you've uh, what you're leading and what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's become a passion for sure. And I think you also see this. I now have residents and others <laughs> that now do want to do hernia surgery. I mean, you actually you're, enjoy it. They want yeah, that's their goal in life now you're, you're young people in the presentations they're doing yeah with this the, the groin the, the the groin pain patients and the things that you're doing robotically and the, like the crazy cases that you're you're taking on and then you're young see what's cool is is like now your young people are getting super excited and yes. you're training them to do this mm -hmm. and they're going to pick up the mantle and and they'll and they'll go to seattle or they'll go to michigan or they'll go to minnesota and like your expertise will then spread to other areas in the country yeah it's congratulations very, it's very lovely to see yeah it's very lovely to see but um so on that note uh since we both kind of aged ourselves already <laughs> i would like your insight because a lot of what we talk about um is about hernia repairs both ventral and inguinal and our audience is super super savvy You'll, i'll show you the questions that they've submitted it's pretty right. amazing um, but let's kick it off because the title of, of this session really is the pros and cons of mesh versus tissue repairs, which is um, you've seen the history, right? You've yeah. seen how mesh repair kind of peaked. Everything was mesh repair. And now where I feel like we're pulling back a little bit and seeing, you know, the pros and cons of mesh repair, but then we also now have to relive what had happened, why we started mesh was because there was a lot of issues with tissue repair. Right. Um, so maybe you can give us a little bit of like, how do you see the world right now? And understanding the history, um, which a lot of people don't really understand um, to kind of give some clarity as to where we are now with meshes and non meshes and good, good stuff, bad stuff. Yeah. And I, and, and again, I think you just dated me again, but I'll, but I'll go with, I'll go with it. <laughs> but yeah. So when I was a surgical resident, we rarely use mesh in the brain. And, and we did tissue repairs. Yeah. And so I learned how to do tissue repairs. And, and, I, and I think that where we need to base ourselves as far as taking care of patients and as far as our practice goes is, is, is in science. 
And so it's, it's not about um, hubris and it's not about attracting patients and it's not about like how we drive you know, uh, you know, people into our office. It's about, about based in, totally in science. And so, right. so when I talk to patients and we published a paper that I know you're aware of that we interviewed over 200 patients about what their thoughts were, why, where their considerations were, where they get their information, yes. how, can we, how can we best you know, impact them as far as their understanding. <clears throat> And for the for the most part, most of the hernia repairs that we do in the groin, a a re, find it first first and foremost, find a good surgeon. I mean, it, I mean, find a good surgeon, and then secondly, in, if you look at the Cochrane studies in two thousand two, and and for your for your listeners and for your viewers, Cochrane studies are uh, physicians who review the data about controversial topics. They review yeah. the best data in the world. They kick out studies that are not very good. The best studies in the world, they review them and they, they, they uh, coalesce them and then they publish them. 2002, 2009, 2018 for ingwar hernias. The majority of folks who have an ingwar hernia should have a mesh-based repair if you look at outcomes, if you look at quality of life and indeed, you know, and there's been a lot of controversy and, and you have been interviewed and asked a ton of times by you know, learning groups, American College of Surgeons and Sages, the American Hernia Society to give lectures about this. So I'm not teaching you anything, but you know, the consideration of mesh and based, mesh based repairs, yeah. there have been meshes that have not done well. Let's just say that right out of the gate. But if you look at the standard meshes that we use, and if you look at those outcomes using mesh and groin repairs, using mesh in ventral hernia repairs and larger umbilical hernias, most of the time, a mesh repair does very well for patients. Right. This is this is not the meshes that are used for for bladder slings and and, and those sorts of things. This is not the way the mesh is applied. And, but there have been bad meshes or, or meshes that have not done well, I should say. And, and then you can have complications associated with, with mesh. And I do walk through, when I talk to my patients, I walk through the individual patients. And there are patients who, like for an ingwer hernia repair, might do very well with a tissue repair. Yeah. And I know you've actually even demonstrated some of this, even robotically actually yeah. going and doing a tissue repair robotically. But, but, but you are a special surgeon. Let's just say out of the gate, you know what you're doing. You're a specialist, absolutely a specialist. But if I'm going to see a good surgeon who's going to, going to do an ingwer hernia repair in me or a ventral hernia repair, I'm going to ask for mesh. I, I will. One of the patients I operated on today is a nice 80-year-old lady who had a tissue repair, and her tissues were not very strong. She was 80 years old. She recurred very quickly. Mm. And then I saw her, and I re-repaired her today yeah. because she was inappropriate for a non-mesh repair. Yeah, and I think that's where the discussion is. One of the questions asked, very simple one, is how do you discuss mesh, mesh versus tissue repair options? Um, understanding that, at least in the United States, patients come to your office already having read a lot, educate themselves, whether it's on Facebook or, or something more legitimate than that. So what is your discussion? And we can, you can talk about ventral or inguinal or, or both. And it's a, for and, and my discussion really starts honestly with 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 either it discuss, I, I will ask them I will start describing you know what their issue is I get on a whiteboard I draw pictures on a whiteboard mm. of what their anatomy looks like what we're what we want to do what's important in the operation and and then I and I will say and let's talk about mesh but I'll come back to that in a minute frequently and then I will sit down and I will say you know tell me about like what your thoughts are about mesh and people frequently have gone online as you know people is, you know, people will go online the people are most likely to have concerns about mesh are people who have done their own research have failed hernias and women quite honestly mm -hmm. because women tend to drive healthcare. they tend to drive the home they also tend to drive healthcare. so they women have done their research yeah and and we discuss what their what their fears are what their questions are what their problems are and then we discuss the appropriateness of mesh in their in their particular problem, whether it's an ingwer hernia repair, ventral hernia repair, uh, or uh, umbilical or, or otherwise, and we discuss the literature, and then there then we discuss the mesh options, because there's permanent synthetic mesh, there's absorbable synthetic mesh, and then there tend to be biologic meshes, and what might actually work for them, and and so sometimes we'll actually find that people will actually compromise with us, and and some of the there's good data on at least two of the absorbable meshes or data coming out on two of the absorbable meshes 
and uh, and it might be very reasonable for for a good um, uh, uh, a patient who is would fit those categories. Let's just say that. Yeah, I have patients that come in saying, "I don't want mesh." I said, "Okay, why don't you want mesh?" And so, "Well, I want the best repair that gives me the least chronic pain." I'm like, "Okay, that would be a laparoscopic repair with mesh," and they right. say, uh, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> so I go through data with them. You know, there's tissue repair is not pain free. It's not chronic pain free. Open repair with mesh, not laparoscopic with mesh is better than all those in terms of outcomes. So yeah, if you really, if that's what you really want, you just want the least chronic pain, best long term results. Get a good laparoscopic repair with mesh uh, for your ingual hernia. Um, so then they start. You know, of course, you have to you have to speak to the patients with respect and kind of understand like where their angst is. But most patients are very reasonable as long as you can kind of explain to them the risks and benefits of whatever their personal situation is. Uh, that's great. The problem that I see is sometimes that uh, you know doctors think they're God. <laughs> they're like. I'm going to offer you only this and the patients feel not empowered in their own care. And so that sometimes may result in, you know, a lot of distrust or, or, you know, if they have any bad outcome and right. that becomes something personal. So, I mean, I frequently, I mean, and I, and I will just tell you, I, because of, like you lack support at your institution when you tried to build a hernia center. And, yeah. and I was very lucky. I, I, you know, Harry Nurkin, who was, who was I'm our still CEO. lacking that support. <laughs> yeah. Harry Nurkin, who was our CEO really supported me. And, and, and so we were able to collect this data. We, and, and, and the, one of the best things I ever did that the first grant I wrote when I got to Charlotte was I was first author and the CEO was second author on the okay. grant. That's what really, that's what really sprung what we, all the data that we're collecting now comes from the, the grant that he and I generated 24 years, 23 years ago. Yeah. And so, but you know, but we can look, I'm, I'm very, I'm in a privilege, I would say I'm in a privileged position. So like we published 1500 laparoscopic angle hernia repairs uh, in, in surgery, you know, two years ago and, you know, 0.6% recu recur recurrence rate at three years, quality of life is good. So I can actually direct the patients to kind of to that study and say, not everybody's ended up perfect, but our outcomes are very good. Yeah. And, this is, and, I, and I also too, and, and I'm sure you've operated on you know, many physicians and I will refer to like the physicians and my own partners that I've operated. And I'll say like yeah. I've operated on six of my partners and this is exactly what I did for them and what they chose in your situation. Yeah. And so with that, the patient's like, well, if it's good enough for your his surgical partners, then, then perhaps I, it's good enough for me. And so, but anyway, but you can't ignore people's, you know, people's, what, what their angst are. You can't ignore right. what they're, you know, even if they've generated what, you know, what their, what their worries are comes from the internet. You have to walk a patient through that. You have to accept that. And then this is their body. This is their life. And you got to take yeah. it seriously. Yeah. So one of the live questions, uh, is hello doctors i have a question about whether a tiny hernia should be repaired with sutures or mesh what's your answer to that i mean most tiny hernias will be in your abdominal wall like an umbilical hernia or epigastric mm -hmm. hernia and mm -hmm. those can be repaired frequently most often actually without mesh yeah those are those are typically suture repair they can be done under, often under local anesthesia mm -hmm. and go home very quickly and it can be done without mesh yep yeah very true and then what are your thoughts about size of mesh and whether that helped, sorry, size of hernia in the groin and whether that is a determinant of mesh or no mesh. Yeah. So I, I so for the groin, the, the different people anatomy, are, it's different anatomy. If someone has a large defect in their groin, and especially if they're an aged patient, I mean, the, all of those patients get mesh in my hands right. I, and, I, and yeah. I tend to, and I tried and, and I use the word direct because it's just the best data, those patients. So, but if you get a younger patient, who has an indirect hernia and they want a tissue repair, a tissue repair, a shoulder ice repair in those patients should actually do pretty well. You right. can do it under local anesthesia, a little IV sedation even, and do them you know, open under local, um, under local. Tell me about, how about if I ask you a question, tell me about your robotic tissue repairs. How is that going? Yeah. So I use it very judiciously. I'm very cautious because I'd like to introduce new technology and new techniques, but I don't want to 
to um, sacrifice it by applying it to everyone. Of so course. yeah, so small hernias, super small, like the ones you can't feel even, usually it's in females, in a thin <clears throat> patient, so low risk patient, um, it's not a recurrent hernia, it's not a large hernia, um, patient's not overweight, uh, and it's a small hernia, robotic is an alternative. So if they don't, let's say you're already in there for another procedure, I operate with gynecologists all the time. I can fix their hernia repair uh, while they're getting ruled out for let's say endometriosis for pelvic pain. I don't have to put mesh in those patients. If it's bilateral, that's a nice opportunity to do it robotically instead of two open surgeries for a small repair. Just think of if they would be a good candidate for a Marcy, yeah. So a small hernia repair, um, then the robotic iliopubic tract repair, which my resident termed uh, ripped, <laughs> R-I-P-T, robotic iliopubic tract repair, um, works really, really well. I would not use it for larger hernias. Right. Um, I had one patient where we could not put mesh in and she, her BMI was 34. And she has chronic pain now because what she's actually doing is she's ripping through it because it is a tension repair. And um, probably by now she has a recurrence. It's just a matter of time and trying to figure out like how to repair it. Yeah. But she was overweight. And uh, I think even, and she had a medium sized hernia. So she's just tearing through the tissue and, and that's probably what's giving her the chronic pain. Yeah, It's an option. It's, it should be something that you can consider. Uh, but you know, like all other repairs, there are risks with it. There's entrapment of the nerve is a major one, the genital femoral nerve. Correct. Can entrap. Right. Yep. Yeah. Another question is how far back do mesh repairs go? For example, have they been done decades ago? So the results of these mesh repairs can be followed long-term over decades. If they have been done for a long time, has mesh changed in terms of what material is used to, um, so that there are perhaps better ones over time and Oh, they also want to see what mesh looks like. But if you come to my office, I'll show you what mesh looks like. But yeah, this is a good question. Can you I enlighten think, everyone how long? I think I think it's a great question. Actually, it's been around. Yeah. So there was a, a very famous surgeon, a guy named Bill Roth, who did some of the first like uh, in, intestinal or gastric resections, showed us how to like sew bowel back together again. He did. Uh, he was in Vienna. He loved music. He was a, uh, a world renowned guy. He had he taught lots of people to came and come in and watch him. And he had this famous quote that if you could actually essentially make tissue, the strength of, of tendon or ligament, you know, we would discover the, the uh, how to fix hernias. Yeah. And so early on, the people use uh, silver wire. So actually make a, essentially make a, braid, yeah. Yeah, make, make a braid out of silver wire and sew that in. Um, tin has been used. A lot of other things have been used, and that was, and so silver was used before 1900 uh, to actually reinforce the abdominal wall, especially in the groin. But the, the before most, your time, this is before your just, time. Just, <laughs> just, just, just a bit. But, but the, but probably the, the most pronounced improvement in mesh was uh, by a guy named Francis Usher in Texas. Uh, actually in, is in Houston, and he is the person who invented Marlex. Of course, it's, it's uses it. It comes from polypropylene. Polypropylene is a uh, comes from the gas industry, the oil industry. It's a byproduct of of, uh, of gas, and he made polypropylene. So it's a knit mesh, which is we're still using today. Now, some of the mesh, the, the mesh has changed a little bit in that the that there is a very dense mesh, with the, so the, the weave is very tight and the mesh mm -hmm. is very heavy and it's very strong, and so we've migrated to you know a less dense mesh. So you get a bit yeah. more tissue incorporation. It's a little less infectable and those sorts of things. Kind of a, there's a heavyweight mesh and a, we people have transitioned a little bit toward midweight meshes for some cases. Yeah, but I will just tell you too. You know, we transition. And I'll just say, pick me. We transitioned to a lighter weight mesh and discovered that the mesh was too light. Work can work for a groin hernia, but it's too light for the abdominal wall. Mm -hmm. And we did animal studies that demonstrated it was strong enough. But the issue was, is that in over 20 months or so, it became uh, uh, more fragile and began mm -hmm. to fracture. And so we had more hernia, hernia failures. Was that the lightweight or the ultra lightweight you're referring to? Well, it's like, it depends on what you would call it, but it's a, it was a 28 grams per meter squared. Yeah. Some would call it ultra lightweight, yeah. I call it lightweight, but it's, it was a very lightweight mesh trying to, trying to eliminate as much foreign body as possible. Yeah. And, it, and it didn't work very well. 
And so, okay, for so there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot where that's right. So a midweight polypropylene is is tends to be what people use an awful lot of, but mm -hmm. there are other meshes that have come in come into play. You know, just because you know, polypropylene was invented in, in the 1950s, first reported in 1956, mm -hmm. and here it is, you know, 2000, you know, 22 for God's sakes, and we're using the same chemical process. Yeah. There are other meshes. So there are absorbable meshes now. Uh, there are meshes made of PTFE that are both solid sheets, which we've kind of gotten away from them, but also the, this mesh that looks kind of like a screen on your porch the made of uh, made of PTFE uh, has actually worked out very well. This, the early studies in that are very, very good. And then also the absorbable meshes, which are, uh, which go away. One goes away. Uh, it's of the most popular one. One goes away in about six months or so, but it leaves a collagen. You tend to make your own collagen sheet behind it. Mm -hmm. Some really good histology, both in animals and in humans, which demonstrate that you kind of make your own mesh behind it. Mm -hmm. And then there's one that lasts more like between 20 and 24 months. And some of that data now is, uh, is, is now coming out on that mesh. And, uh, and, the, and we don't know, but the problem is we don't know exactly in whom the best patients are to yeah, use it. Just, that's correct. Yeah, yeah that's right. the Ramshaw kind of, you know, take the same mesh out of two different people and it may look perfect in one and kind of oxidize and destroy it in the other. Right. Or in the same patient, do the exact same operation, two different patients, same exact operation by the same surgeon, excellent outcome on one and chronic pain in the other. So yeah, yeah it's just, we don't know. Uh, how to predict these. So on that note, there's another question that says, what is the chronic pain rate of a shoulder dice ingual hernia pair performed by a volume expert? Is it lower than the laparoscopic repair with mesh also by an expert? Yeah, and I think that, you know, it is, you know, if you look at tissue repairs by surgeons that track their outcomes and then publish their outcomes, yeah. There was a, there, it's part of the Cochrane review, one of the, one of the Cochrane reviews, they looked at shoulder arch repair versus an open ingual hernia repair with mesh. And mm -hmm. the open ingual hernia repair with mesh had less chronic discomfort, like had a better quality of life and a, a fewer recurrences. Patients were back at work sooner. But if, then if you compare that open ingual hernia repair to a laparoscopic repair, and when I, when I talk to my patients, <clears throat> Our long-term outcomes for an opening or hernia repair with mesh versus a laparoscopic repair, long-term are the same, but the short-term outcomes, typically patients are back on their feet sooner, recover faster with a laparoscopic repair compared to an open repair with mesh. Yeah, but yeah. as far as show dice, the data, the data, even for people who publish their own data, people who, so you have to be a relatively high volume surgeon to publish your own data. Uh, the outcomes are better with mesh. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Uh, in Australia, mesh products are being approved with a post-market surveillance system. This is a patient from Australia. Joining yeah, us. Fantastic. Do you see this? Do you see this as the same as putting mesh implants um, just to see how it works? In other words, just experimenting on patients without much prior um, understanding of how the mesh will do in patients. There is no registry, so there is, there is no real way of being reported. What's your thoughts about that? So producing new mesh products. And, and I think you were in this session where we had a discussion. This would have been about, about two or maybe three years ago now because of COVID at the America's Hernia Society. When, you know, if you get a new hip or a new knee, you get a card that says, this is what you yeah. got. Here's your, here's your number to call in. This is where you report your outcomes. And we yeah. should do the same with hernia meshes. It should be, I think it should be required. And so in Australia, yeah. one of the things about Australia, <clears throat> and this, so the, the mesh controversy has hit our shores, no question. And you are waist deep in all this, maybe deeper than yeah. this is, you're a leader in maybe the too deep. country. <laughs> you, know, you are a leader in the country in this because, because you, I mean, the, you've heard the bell ringing and you've answered it. I'll just say that. And it's, yeah. and so it may, it's, it is. And now they're just stomping on me. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, but, but you, but, but you're very good at it. So let's just say that. But, but so the, this is rolled up on the shores of the United States, but in Australia, yeah. New Zealand, and the UK, I mean, it's not a bell, it's a huge gong. And so mm -hmm. in Australia, what they've, how they've responded in Australia 
with this. And it really started with the pelvic meshes, not so much the hernia meshes, but the yeah. hernia meshes have played a role in it. But it's the yeah. pelvic meshes really rung the gong here. But what they've decided is, is that all the meshes that are on the market already in Australia are going to have to be recertified. And you're going yeah. to have to, and so not only do you have- like, EU too, uh, right? In the EU, I think they're it, doing the yeah, same. I know it's in Australia. I've not seen it in the EU. Pending. But, but, but in Australia, for sure, and New Zealand, what's happening is, is that the meshes that are already on the market, like with the FDA, you get a mesh on the market, it's kind of done and dusted, you know, and then the FDA will monitor uh, things that are reported to them. Yes. But you don't have to have post-market surveillance where you as a company report your outcomes. For me, let me pay $25 more for a piece of mesh and then like make it available for me to be able to report my own outcomes. That's happening in Australia. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to do this. The meshes are going to have to be essentially go undergo almost reapproval. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's appropriate. Yeah, Any product that goes in my body, give me a, give me a chance to report on it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, similar vein of questions. There's plenty of questions, by the way. Why is it that there are numerous studies regarding negative outcomes of mesh repairs that consistently note the need for rigorous studies, yet we never see any of these studies being done? Without robust studies, how can there ever be true improvement for the patients? There is this feeling by patients that we're not studying well, anything. Did a patient write that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They would need a job as a research <laughs> coordinator. It says, without robust studies, how can there ever be true improvement for the patients and the acknowledgement from surgeons that these improvements are necessary? You're speaking to the choir here. <laughs> here we go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, 100%. it's not like we have no studies. That's correct. But we definitely don't have enough so, to. Let me let me raise me. one issue here. Yeah. So like, so the America's Hernia Society. The abdominal core, uh, abdominal wall, abdominal core collective, like what used to be the American ACH, Hernia Society ACH, Quality, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. American Hernia Society Quality, uh, collaborative quality uh, data that they're collecting. One of the real issues, and I'm going to point at patients right now. So one of the issues with this is, and I've talked to Mike Rose, and they, Mike Rose has done a great job with this. Ben Plus has done a great job with this. They've yeah. tried to drive this as hard as they can. So this quality collaborative that we put together, the American Hernia Society paid for, and now they've they've broken this off and they're trying to drive data collection and hernia repair. In the United States, uh-huh. In the United States. Thank you very much. And so in the United States, <clears throat> and so surgeons can sign up, they can help collect their own data. But a lot of the data that's entered into it is surgeon collected data. The surgeons put their own data in. At our institution, we don't surgeons never put their own data in because I might say, mm, I prescribed an antibiotic, but I'm trying to prevent an infection versus treating an infection. If I prescribe an antibiotic, there's an infection, period. Mm -hmm. The problem with the, 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 the quality collective that we've put together is patients aren't responding. Patients are given the opportunity yeah, to respond and they're not responding. So the, the, so the data, you know what the, the, the last study that I saw with actually reported data, uh, when they looked at epidurals versus no epidurals, only 8% of the patients had long-term data, 8%. Patients were given the opportunity to report their own outcomes and they didn't. Yep. So I think for us, you know, yes, as surgeons, we need better outcomes, absolutely. But we need to make sure that patients will report their own outcomes when they're given the opportunity. Yeah. Okay, this is a two-part question. Okay. Um, say you have a mesh-fearing male patient with a recurrent ingle hernia after a failed Liechtenstein. Yeah. So mesh repair was done, hernias recurred, um, and now they fear mesh. So the patient is adamant against mesh and the hernia is fairly large, let's say inguinal scleral hernia. So do you say, no, I won't do your operation because you definitely need mesh, you already failed mesh, or do you try to convince them that a mesh repair will provide the best result? That's part one. Wow. Part two is Question. after inguinal mesh removal. No, that's not part two. Is that part two? It is. Um, after ingual mesh removal, so similar to this patient, what is the efficacy of a tissue repair? These are two different people asking with similar questions. How frequently do you either of you consent to doing this in your practice? So replace mesh with a tissue repair. What are, what are your thoughts about that? So, I, so the first question is, you've done in Liechtenstein fairly large 
inguinoscrotal recurrence, my, what I would tell the patient is, is that I need to do this laparoscopically and I need to do it with mesh. Yeah. And what I would do then is, as I would direct them to, to our data, the paper that I've mentioned earlier that we published and with almost 1500 patients and over a third of those patients were recurrent after opening or hernia repair. And so our outcomes in those patients are very good. But one thing I would, I would stress to the patient is I understand. Now, there's a, they're worried about mesh. They're worried about mesh causing complications, worried about mesh causing, you know, causing a problem. And this is a, especially if it's a young patient and that sort of thing. But my answer to that, to that patient is, is you know, the, the most difficult hernia is the recurrent hernia. And yeah. the most difficult hernia is the two-time recurrent hernia instead of the one-time recurrent hernia. Yeah. And so yeah. for me to believe that, or to look at this patient and say, you know, Hey, I'm a good surgeon. You know, I can do this. What I need to do is I need to fall back to the best data that we have. And, and I'll just say that like in a data at our institution, and it, I'm sure would be resembled much like yours is you need to have this done laparoscopically by a very skilled, you know, very skilled surgeon. If I had that, if I was in that situation, I'd call you, or I'd call my partner, Kent Kircher or Vedra Augenstein mm -hmm. in my institution. And I would say, look, I just need a laparoscopic or hernia repair with mesh. Just take care of me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I totally agree. What patients don't understand is like a big inguinal scrotal hernia. I mean, technically you may be able to do a tissue repair <laughs> on that. Let's not talk recurrent, but man, that's so much tension on horrible thin tissue. So right. if you want to talk about chronic pain, that's going to be chronic pain. Constantly right. try and tear through this really thinned out tissue, multiple suture layers. I mean, that's a very painful. So the fact that mesh is bad doesn't necessarily mean that the tissue repair will give you a better outcome, especially for these larger ones. I completely agree with you. Yep. But I, I would say though, if the patient has some mesh problem, uh, and their hernia, we're talking groin here and their hernia is small, I'm happy to remove the mesh and do a tissue repair. That's, that's okay. It's not ideal, but that's okay if it's right. small and feasible. And, and, and so sometimes you get these patients who will have, have had an opening or hernia repair, have a recurrence and have pain, and they're worried that the mesh is causing their pain, but they also right. have a hernia recurrence. And so the, yes. first thing that, the first thing that we'll do in those patients is re-repair their angle hernia laparoscopically. Yeah. Let them, let them, I mean, you could, you could actually go in, do a triple, you know, cut the nerves in the groin, take the mesh out after doing a laparoscopic repair. But often the pain is caused by the recurrence and simply re-repairing their hernia will take care of it. Okay. We've got some questions about mesh implant illness or mesh reactions. Okay. Um, very interesting. Uh, one. So one of the questions was actually submitted uh, prior. So let's just start with that. And that really is maybe looking at the history of, um, of mesh reactions, because I feel like we're seeing more of it. So the question is, do you think mesh reactions are a modern day problem? Were you seeing patients react to their meshes in the past? And in the past, it means, you know, yeah. when we started. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I it's very uncommon to see them. So well, let me just back this up. So everyone reacts to a foreign body. Yes. Any foreign body that you have, whether it's a cataract lens or it's going to be a, like if you get an, a vascular graft and you, know, you get to replace a blood vessel or, or a mesh, you will have a reaction to it. And you're going to have almost always have some sort of inflammatory reaction to it. And usually it's very localized. It's right on the mesh. And, and, quite, on, and quite honestly, the, the, we don't heal without an inflammatory reaction. Whenever you have a cut, whenever you have a, you know, a laceration, you have the inflammatory phase of healing that comes in. And so when, you're, when your wound becomes, uh, that's healing becomes pink around the edges and, and that sort of thing, the scab becomes really, really firm. You're having an inflammatory reaction to that. And that's part of the healing process. And so the problem with, with, with some meshes and, and can be for certain individuals is that you can have a, a real inflammatory reaction to mesh that may be exaggerated, much like what you mm -hmm. mentioned, Bruce Ramshaw, our good friend Bruce, has talked about. You can have different reactions to difficult chemical materials, yeah. At, but at, as an individual, so there is no, there is no, and I shouldn't say there is no. There are rare recordings 
of allergic reactions to polypropylene, which is the, one of the most common, or to PTFE. There's very rare recordings of, of, of allergic reactions to those materials, very rare. Mm -hmm. But you can develop a bit of an inflammatory reaction, but it also it has to do with the con construct of the mesh and the, and the individual. The, but as far as like generalized, generalized inflammatory reaction in the body, you know, there, has, there have been people who have raised the, the, the question of like a generalized inflammatory action within the body. And I just haven't seen that. Yeah. And I don't know if you've, you've seen that and seen I that see it more. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you get a lot of patients who come from all over to talk to you and see you about those types of yeah. things. And I'll let you answer that question now. So we actually published our paper uh, on this full form body reaction. So every single mesh yeah. that was removed, we looked, we looked at the pathology. 100% of them had a foreign body reaction. 100% right. had chronic fibrosis. These are all classic findings of any implant. Then we categorized them. How many of these people had mesh removed because of chronic pain? And how many was incidental? Like they had a uh, recurrent hernia or they needed, it was a mesh infection um, and therefore not truly a foreign body. Like your body was not reacting. No difference. It made absolutely no difference. Right. Right. Um, what your clinical status was, the pathology was exactly the same. Right. So that's something that I, I, I tell my patients all the time because these lawsuits uh, against the mesh industry very much focus on foreign body reaction and chronic inflammation and fibrosis, which every single mesh product will have regardless of body. why it's being yeah. removed. Every so, single foreign body, yeah. So that was kind of a, a nice kind of way to help teach the patients a little bit. But I am seeing a larger proportion of my patients requiring mesh removal because they are having some weird head to toe systemic reaction. They're getting chronic fatigue, brain fog, et cetera. And then um, we actually uh, present our data and hopefully we'll get published this year, which is looking back to see like categorizing what are the symptoms, what percentage of people get these mesh implant illness type symptoms. Um, and then what risk factors do they have? Like how many of them had autoimmune disorder already or some type of inflammatory um, disease already, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, mast cell activation syndrome, um, fibromyalgia, and those kind of things to try and understand a little bit better, is there a subpopulation of patients? Are they thinner? Is there, are they more likely to be female? What are we seeing in these subpopulations that are making them potentially a little bit more reactive to a mesh product? Um, based on my experience, I'm very reluctant to put mesh in people that have like really bad autoimmune disorders, mast cell activation syndrome, um, uh, people that come in, they're like allergic to a million things. Right. One poor guy was allergic to polyester. Like he literally is allergic. Like he works in the shipyard here. <laughs> and when he walks through the shipyard, his eyes start burning and tearing because of the polyester resin in the air. Oh, wow. He can't wear polyester socks because he'll blister. And of course he got polyester mesh in during his laparoscopic ventral oh, hernia repair. Yeah. Wow. Poor guy. I mean, how unlucky can you be? So there are real like allergies, like you said, very, very yeah. uncommon, very uncommon, but uh, it can happen. But when, but, but when you know, patients, but then when there's a million hernia repairs a year in the United States, yes, patients yeah. will have patients will have that issue. That's it. We it's hard to talk percentage when the end the total number is so huge. So 0.1 percent of a million a year adds up, right? Thousands of, people, of patients, a lot of right? people. Yeah. So, so, are you using absorbable meshes in your practice? Um. We can talk about that <laughs> with another oh. question that's coming up. Yeah. Um, yes and no. My concern is some of the synthetic absorbables are still highly inflammatory in nature. Right. And so I don't want to add that. So by like the pure biologics are doing better in terms of inflammation, but they don't work for hernia repairs, usually long-term. So it's a little bit of an issue that I would like to hopefully see better products out there for with lower inflammatory potential, but also not as kind of poor outcomes long-term as like most biologics. Okay. Biologics. Okay, so someone heard you talk about neurectomies. 
So they yeah. said, Dr. Hennifer mentioned neurectomy for treatment of pain. Does he support selective neurectomy or triple neurectomy because of the interconnection between the three growing nerves that may be residual source of pain if selective neurectomy is done? Can diagnostic anesthetic injection hone down to only resecting one nerve? That's a patient. I was, was going to say, <laughs> do they want to do a fellowship with me and come and do hernia? <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. That's an amazing right? Yeah, right so, every week yeah i love yeah, it if we if we have um a uh in, in anyone in, who, in whom i'm going to do i would consider doing a triple neurectomy they need to see an anesthesiologist they need to see a pain specialist okay. and 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 i tell people all the time the most um uh the most dangerous part of any mesh resection or, or chronic pain is me if we can if we can have a a pain specialist take care of their discomfort and leave me out of it then right. terrific but if they yeah. if they do an injection and they localize one nerve that's called like the iliowingal nerve, this is it, 100%, this is the nerve, then you can make a small incision out lateral and actually cut the iliowingal nerve and then see if that, and this can be done essentially under local, maybe a little sedation yeah. and leave the mesh that, because if you don't have a hernia recurrence and you only have discomfort and that's the nerve that's involved, if you cut that nerve, then frequently with that one, tra transecting that one nerve, frequently because of it the, and they were correct you get this overlapping of those three nerves so frequently you know, even if you cut one of those nerves you still have normal essentially normal sensation yeah. but if they inject the iliolingual nerve and the pain goes away then yes you can just cut the cut that single nerve and be done with it but most often when i'm operating on someone in in because if there's one nerve that's causing a problem they can just ablate it and they don't need yes. me yes so so if, when I'm going in, most of the time, I'm doing a triple neurectomy. Because, yeah, so, yeah, because they can't ablate all three. What's surprising is there's not that much data on what happens once you do these neurectomies. So we looked at our own. Um, and what we found was if you do a surgical neurectomy, right? Cut the nerve for pain, neuroma, nerve entrapment, whatever the situation right. is, preoperative neuralgia of that specific nerve. There's about a 4% neuro neuroma rate, um, at least in my hands, uh, which is about the same. I think in the, in the, in the publications before, it's like around 5%, so 4%, 5%. But if you do kind of like a prophylactic neurectomy, some people do it, um, or the nerve is cut incidentally for whatever reason, let's say it was in the way or you didn't want to risk injuring it, we found 0% risk of neuralgia post-op which was Correct. surprising because i'm always afraid of cutting any nerve that doesn't need to be touched um but surprising that we saw z z no consequence besides numbness but no consequence in terms of pain and neuralgia after cutting a nerve that's otherwise healthy yeah one of the one of the if you had to say you know here are the 20 articles that's influenced you as a hernia surgeon. That, that one article that came out of Scandinavia that was published in the Annals of Surgery where they didn't cut the iliac nerve in an opening or hernia repair, and they did yeah. manipulate it versus non-manipulated. And if you manipulated yeah. the iliac nerve and didn't transect it, they had a 21% chance of chronic pain. Yeah. And so, and so the iliac nerve, if it's in the way, it's laying over the, if I have to manipulate that nerve, I'm going to transect it. And most patients don't know that I have. But as, but as far as like, one of the things is you mentioned, like doing a triple neurectomy, mm -hmm. there are some people who will do a triple neurectomy inside the abdomen or in the preperitoneal space. Yeah. yeah so the, the, I don't do those. Uh, and and one, yeah, because what you'll see is you, you cut the muscular branches and, and then yeah. your whole groin tends to expand. And so I've, I've not done those because, because of that. And, and then that's what we're seeing now is that you'll, you may get your pain taken care of, but then you're growing just kind of the, all the muscles will come yeah. out. They're paralyzed. In that yeah. Area. Uh, I started with laparoscopic triple neurectomy. I think we had like a little poster at Sages, like, Hey, you can do laparoscopic triple neurectomy. We like th our first four patients, I think. Um, and then my fifth patient got the denervation injury. I'm like, Ooh, that's horrible complication. So I pretty much have stopped doing that yep. unless it's very selective and I do it as distal as possible. Right. Um, but then a larger paper came out uh, saying that it works great. And I spoke to that, that surgeon afterwards at the meeting, I think it was Pacific Coast Surgical Association. I'm like, I'm seeing denervations. I didn't see you talk about that. He's like, yeah, it happens. I'm like, but you didn't 
present that. So now right. there's this great paper that says laparoscopic triple neurectomy works. And that's why, like with my paper with the robotic iliopedic track repair, I don't want everyone to do that repair because no. it's it has problems the same way triple neurectomy does laparoscopically. And um, the denervation injury, you're right, is a huge complication that's very hard to address. You got to be careful with your trade-offs. Yeah. That's for sure. Okay. The question, next question, actually, you'll like this one. I'm going to do this just for you. Is there a mesh size to hernia size ratio that you use? I.e., for example, under 10 millimeters should have a small to medium mesh. Greater than 10 millimeters may be large mesh. My indirect hernia had a neck of only five to eight millimeters, but the surgeon repaired it with a large 3D max, which seems overkill for a small hernia. Have you had pain issues in the area? Um, so using a mesh so large to rectify a tiny hernia could be causing pain because of scar tissue. What are your thoughts on that? I would like you to address this actually for ventral because that's something that you've looked into, yeah. um, which is the size of the hernia versus the size of the appropriate mesh, number one. And then also to comment on standard sizes for ingle hernias and why we use certain sizes. Yeah, so I, it's a, I think that's, these questions sound like surgeons sitting in an audience <laughs> or, 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 or at least resident sitting in an audience. I mean, you're, 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 you're the people who listen to this are pretty sophisticated. It's pretty sophisticated, I know. Pretty bad gum sophisticated. Well, it brings me back every week. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. So, so for ventral hernias, what we found is, is that the, the larger the mesh for the defect actually decreases recurrence and does not impact quality of life and does not increase the infection rate. And so, you know, if you've got a defect that's this big and then you put in a mesh that's this big versus that big, the bigger the, the, bigger the mesh decreases your recurrence rate. And so we put our meshes in the pre-peritoneal position and in the lion's share of the, the, the open ventral hernias that we do. So the mesh does not touch the intestine mm -hmm. up against the muscular or the fascial abdominal wall but the bigger the mesh for a ventral hernia, the better. And so for and so a ratio of about four to one for a moderate size defect is what we found worked the best. Less than three to one. And so if you have a that's an, area, right? Three to one area. area. So it's just so if you've got a six by six defect, so you're 36 square centimeters for the defect, you want to be four to one is what we found works in in larger than four to one, didn't matter. For ventral, so three, three, for ventral hernias, less than three to one, increased recurrence rate. So yeah. I want a larger mesh for, for a ventral hernia. It doesn't negatively impact me. It just doesn't, but it impacts my recurrence rate. So for an inguinal hernia, you know, for the most part, you know, we use a, a fairly standard size mesh. You know, and you know, of course, if we're operating on a smaller person, we'll use a, you know, a smaller mesh. But our, rec our repair for the most part, if you have an inguinal hernia, is very standard. Yes. And, and so if I'm doing an open with mesh or I'm doing it laparoscopically with mesh, we are going to repair that whole floor. Mm -hmm. And we're going to, we're not just going to repair the one hole you have because there's always a chance that you'll develop a weakness just, just right, medial next, lateral, to it. right mm -hmm. next to it, medial mm -hmm. lateral to it. And so you never want to come back because if someone has to come back in your groin, the chance of a complication or problem or pain goes up significantly. So the reoperative reoperative groin is a problem. And so I just want someone to do like you know, do a standard open or laparoscopic repair. In, you know, I'm, you know, if I'm operating on a smaller woman, smaller mesh, but I got to cover that whole area laparoscopically right. or open. Bigger yeah. guy, I might use a really big mesh, but I've got to cover that whole space where they can develop a hernia in the future because I'm never coming back and I never want them to come back. And this is based on, people have actually tried using different size meshes and there's a standard mesh for groins where there's a balance between it not being too big where it overlaps with a bunch of unnecessary areas and not so small that you get a hernia recurrence. So a large 3D max is pretty standard for almost every groin hernia unless you're a really small petite lady like maybe a small asian petite lady or like a huge guy um, with a large hernia yep. okay then can you believe our hour is almost over is it really wow right yeah uh, but we have a lot of questions but uh, i will i will respect um your time so this next question 
three different people have asked. So we're gonna, we're gonna read all three of them. So one is, what does the data say about how mesh ages in the body over 20, 30 or four years? But who this, are these people? I know. Second, similar is, can you talk about complications with hybrid mesh degrading and causing foreign bodies? And then the next uh, similar one, uh, I think I told you a little bit about someone has been following you and knew that you were talking at the American Hernia Society meeting. And so they saw perhaps you were talking about your data on um, Ovitex, which is a hybrid mesh versus Stratus, which is a biologic mesh. And what's your experience with that? So this is like about mesh deg degradation and also biologic versus hybrid meshes. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that is just amazing. Don't you love it? I love it. I love it. I love it. So, so as far as, as far as mesh deg degradation, no question there is mesh, mesh will change slowly over time. And so uh, I think, and we've mentioned Bruce now, Bruce Ramshaw for the third time. Yes. Bruce did a really nice study demonstrating that you'll have some chemical change in the mesh over time. The mesh has become more oxidative. Uh, oxidized, they actually become a little more fragile, a little more crystalline. Mm -hmm. And so the standard mesh that we use is polypropylene. And I'll just say that you know, we tried to back off as hard as we could about 15, seven, 17 years ago to using lightweight meshes for ventral hernia repair. And so one of the things that we did is we did an animal study, we did in pigs, and we studied these meshes and it, and at six, at just about six months. And we demonstrated that when we harvested these meshes, these meshes were strong enough for humans to repair their abdominal wall. And yeah. I think this question that, that was asked is brilliant in that, so yeah, so six months, we're like, yes, this mesh works. We're gonna decrease the mass of the meshes. The mesh is gonna be wider pore. They're less infectable. They hold less bacteria. I mean, lots of things that we studied in our lab. And Alfie Carbonell, Will Cobb, uh, Yuri Novitsky and Mike Rosen did when they, when they worked with me. And so we then immediately started using these in humans. And the problem for me is, is that I've been at the same institution for 23 and a half years and have not left because we have long-term follow-up on our patients. And what right. we began to see is, is that six month follow-up was not long enough. Mm -hmm. What we saw in humans at six months between a midweight and a heavyweight mesh and the lightweight meshes, the outcomes are the same. You get out to like 12 months, they're the same. At about 18 months, there was a break. Mm. The lightweight meshes began to fracture. They became, they became more crystalline and became crystalline enough compared to the heavier weight meshes, the midweight and the heavyweight meshes, that they fractured and they, they would actually tear. And then we got recurrences for ventral hernias, not so much for groin hernias, but for ventral hernias, the ventral abdominal wall hernia. And so that question, you're absolutely correct. And so, and, and, and I'll just tell you that the uh, Tiffany Cox, when, when, when she presented this data at the American College of Surgeons demonstrating that yes, it worked in, in animals in, in, in six months, but in, in, in humans in short term, but between 18 and 20 months, there was a break point. And yeah. so, I mean, we have to tell on ourselves. And so we actually changed what we did uh, because of that. Yeah, it, the mesh has changed. We need long-term outcomes and we need the patients to help us. As far as like Ovatex and Stratus. And, and so I had worked with Ovatex as one of their, uh, the consultants early on, just like talking to them about their mesh and, and, and like combining uh, some of these, uh, you know, the possibility of combining the uh, permanent suture in their mesh and that sort of thing. And I'll just tell you, we just don't have a lot of data with Ovitex at all. You know, we, we used, we, we've used an awful lot of Stratus because we take care of a lot of very complex hernias, patients yeah. who have infections, patients who have infected meshes, patients who have, with their intestines are growing you know, through their abdominal wall and they have a hernia. So very complex infected cases. And so we've used an awful lot of stratus, which is a, which is a, a, a non-cross link. So it's a kind of a native collagen porcine mesh. It's made from porcine skin. They take all the, uh, the, the things that react out of it and then they, uh, they sterilize it and we've used it in the abdominal wall. And we actually, uh, if we repair these, use this mesh in an extra peritoneal position, don't put it inside the intestine against the, excuse me, inside the abdomen against the intestine, but put it uh, just against the muscle of the fascia. Our outcomes have been very good, but, but Ovitex is new and there's, there's not a lot of data 
uh, with Ovitex at all. And so if someone's going to use it, I think one of the things that we have to do in, in, in America, uh, especially is, is looking at when we get new products on, yeah. on the docket, if surgeons are going to, surgeons are going to use this, it, they need to know what their own outcomes are. And so if a surgeon has a new mesh and has no reported outcomes, no recorded outcomes of their own, that's going to make me, that's going to make me question the use of that mesh quite honestly. And so I think, you know, the only way we can improve is that we have to accept that we're going to have things come out that are going to be better. But if you're going to give up something, if you're going to do something new, you got to give up something old and you got to make sure the new thing is better than the old thing. Right. And so without any data, you know, we don't know. And so then it is that data, that, that, that mesh needs to be tracked for sure. This is awesome hour. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I feel like I want to do it again and again. You should be like my co-host. All we do is just talk back and forth. And <laughs> this was so much fun. I love it. I love it. Well, it's so it's so good to talk about talk to someone who is a who is a leader, really passionate, passionate for their patient, patient advocate. No, well, I mean, you get asked to give these lectures all over the country and before COVID, all over the world about like exactly what it is that you do. You know, yeah. being you know, one hernia expert, but also being an advocate for the people that you take care of. And uh, you, you got your priorities in, the, priorities in the right place. I love it. See, I mean, now you're experiencing how fun it is. So why wouldn't I do this all the time? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. It's, you just finished surgery and came straight over and, and did this hour with me. So I'm very, very grateful. I hope to see you soon at, at some of the meetings coming up. And so yeah. please, everyone, um, you got lots of fans here. Everyone is thanking you on, uh, on these chats here and I'm um, very grateful so for your time. And thank you everyone for Hernia Talk um, live, our, our weekly q and I will post the link to this so you can watch and share this awesome hour with Dr. Henniford on my YouTube channel. And I um, hope you all have a nice, safe, uh, safe evening and um, sorry to all the Bengals fans because LA we won. <laughs> <laughs> Bye guys. Bye Todd. Thank, Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks so much. Thank you.